on behalf of the World Affairs Council, um, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished guests. We have Claire uh, Brindis, who's the uh, Philip R. Lee Institute. She's the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies at the University of California in San Francisco. Um, she's also a director of the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health. Um, then we have Denise Dunning, Dunning, who's the executive director and founder of Let Girls Lead at the Public Health Institute. Dr. Denning is also a professor for the University of California at San Francisco, Masters of Science in, Glo excuse me, in Global Health Program. Then we have Elizabeth Gore, who is the first resident entrepreneur for the United Nations Foundation. Ms. Gore previously served as the Vice President of Global Partnerships at the United Nations Foundation. And then we have Rhea Singh, who is a senior at Hillsdale High School in San Mateo, California. And since August of 2012, Ms. Singh has served as a teen advisor to Girl Up a campaign of the UN Foundation, and she recently became a Girl Up co-chair. So you can read the full biographies of each of our speakers in this evening's program. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our panelists for a discussion of girls' leadership and advocacy around the world. So I'm going to start by asking Elizabeth the very first question. Can you tell us why it is important to invest in girls? Uh, well, the answer is sitting to my right. Um, you know, girls like Aria are all over the planet. Um, I think the, the greatest commodity the world has right now are the 600 million adolescent girls living in developing countries. And they are bright and full of um, excitement and, and smart and a willingness to give back to their community. So to me, they're the best investment on the planet. Unfortunately, only two cents of every development dollar are, is actually going specifically to adolescent girls. And we have not moved that needle very much. Only a few, few years back, it was half a cent. So we have a lot of work to do to invest in these girls. Um, but I, the ROI on investing in girls is very high. Um, every year of education a girl gets globally, she usually earns 20% more every single year she goes. I mean, it's incredible. And women and girls generally put 90% of their income back into their communities. Um, most of all, I have a two-year-old little girl, and I can't imagine her not having the opportunity to get married past the age of 15, um, not get HIV AIDS, um, and have a full education in a life that we all deserve. Um, but girls are global. Um, you know, I have a teen advisor sitting next to me who is the chairman of a board at the UN, which is pretty special. Um, but girls in refugee camps have that same potential and opportunity. So for me, it's very personal because I have a little girl. Uh, but also from an economic standpoint, it's a great return on investment. Um, and there are incredible programs like Agali that we'll hear about later um, and others out there that are really lifting girls up everywhere they are. So for me, that's the number one reason. Great. Thanks. And Denise, can you tell us what is Let Girls Lead? Yeah, absolutely. So Let Girls Lead is a program based here in the Bay Area at the Public Health Institute. And our vision is that girls have the power to transform their own lives, their families, their communities, and the world. And so what we really do is work to empower girls and their allies through economic empowerment, through advocacy, through education, and through uh, compelling storytelling. And what we really are trying to work towards is a world where girls have a seat at the global table and girls have a voice in the global conversation. Because, you know, like Elizabeth just mentioned, girls face tremendous challenges and yet have this incredible potential to create change. And so that's really what we're focused on. And rather than telling you what it is, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who Let Girls Lead is. Um, so one of the young women that is a part of our program is a young woman named Elva, who is a Guatemalan leader in a town called Concepcion Chiquirichapa, which I'm sure none of you can say three times fast, <laughs> um, which is a town about eight hours on a bumpy road from Guatemala City. And in this town, you know, the challenges are enormous. So less than 10% of indigenous girls actually finish school, elementary school. So they're not even finishing basic elementary school. 
Um, more than half, actually 54%, have their first baby before they turn 18. So this is a community that has incredible problems facing girls, and Elva and a group of other girls decided that they wanted to do something about that. And so they joined a program that we have sponsored through the Adolescent Girls Advocacy and Leadership Initiative and really learned how to become leaders and speak up for girls' rights and launched a community mobilization campaign with local leaders, parents, religious leaders, indigenous community leaders, really trying to get the community to both understand the need and the value of investing in girls. And over the course of this initiative, they were actually able they ran into a lot of obstacles, um, but they were able to get the mayor of their town to focus specifically on investing in girls. So passing policies and providing the funding that guarantee that girls have access to education and basic health care services. So that's really kind of what we're about and what we do. And we, you know, we were in Guatemala this summer creating a film. We were creating Poder, and which tells Elba's own story and what she has been able to do. And while we were there, we thought a lot about you know, not just telling girls stories, but actually creating the space and the opportunity for girls to tell their own stories. And so we created Let Girls Lead's Global Girls Conversation, which is really focused on giving girls the opportunity to raise their voices and tell their stories and their own successes and their own solutions of how they're improving their own lives, their families, and their communities. And we're super excited about it. I think you guys saw some clips right before we came in. Um, and it's just a, it's a, been a really exciting process for us to see how you can get people excited, both understanding the need and the opportunity for investing in girls. Great, thank you. And uh, Claire, I want to go to you next. Um, what does the research tell us about successful strategies to empower girls around the U.S. and uh, around the world and here in the U.S.? Well, I think that's a very important um, point that you're raising about the role of research and capturing the voices and the data behind some of the information we've been hearing so far in the panel. In reality, there are many, many kids and young women in need, even in our own country. And we have to be very cognizant of the fact that we have um, sex trafficking that's happening in the United States. There are young people who have um, experienced a lot of intimate violence or domestic violence growing up. So while we are very aware that the international lessons can be applicable to the U.S., U.S. lessons can be also applicable uh, internationally. And we're living now because of technology in a smaller and smaller world. So the research points out that making wise investments, giving these kinds of opportunities that we've already been hearing about, are very key. But the reality is the kind of research points out to the very importance of bringing young men into the picture as well. And some of the innovations that we've had in the state of California has been on how do you change the perceptions of young men and their fathers and other village elders to begin to change the conversation. I'm so delighted to see young men in the audience today because that is part of the solution. Young women will not be able to be totally self-actualized if they don't have supportive men in their lives. And a major question for all of us, and the research has begun to uncouple, is what's so threatening to the society when women become educated? Is there a sense that there's a loss of control? Is there a sense that somehow um, the advancement of women would belittle the role of men? So when we begin to have positive deviance, and positive deviance are those young women in locations like Guatemala that we've just been hearing about or through the UN, where the young women can begin to show the early adopters, those individuals in their communities, that having young women be educated and well-informed can not only improve their own lives, but also improves the lives of their partners. Because so many of these young women are living and growing in situations that are economically very fragile. Where, whether you're speaking about um, uh, communities in Africa or even in our own state, where a quarter of young people are growing up in poverty. So we have to understand that it's a win-win when we engage young men as well as young women. Great, thank you. And uh, Ria, I wanted to ask you, how have you been um, a leader for girls here in the Bay Area 
And what have you seen other girls uh, your age do in their leadership capacity with Girl Up? Okay, so I'm going to actually answer that question the other way around. So the reason that I got started um, and became so passionate about leadership and empowering girls is because I saw other girls. I saw inspiring girls who, who took it upon themselves to make a difference. Um, it started actually on a trip to India, with, uh, which is where my parents were born, my older sister. Um, we went to my mom's ancestral village, and I saw the school that my mom started. Um, and there were over 200 girls um, who were all related to me. It's kind of a long story. I won't get into that. But they were all related to me. They all had my face, uh, these cheeks, these beautiful eyes. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, but yeah, I saw these girls who were living in a developing country and were smiling at every little thing that made them happy and despite their situation, which was definitely one of the most inspiring moments of my life. Um, and since then, I've been able to come back here and, and realize that I can empower myself to speak on behalf of these girls and tell people that these girls are out here, out there, um, and they do deserve a voice. So uh, I was actually last year, I became a part of the Girl Up campaign, uh, which is a part of the United Nations Foundation. And that's allowed me to connect with girls in the Bay Area, which is, has been such an interesting experience getting to know girls who I probably wouldn't have been able to get to know at 16, 17, 17, 17 right now. Um, and I've just, I've been able to connect with them on such a different level, such a common bond. We're all girls. We all kind of relate in that way and we all have a passion for um, that issue. Great, thank you. And uh, now let's focus a little bit more on some of the specific strategies. And Elizabeth, I want to go to you again. Um, can you talk about strategies that have been successful to improve girls' education, health, mm -hmm. globally? Uh, well, I think we can go global to local, um, or maybe the other way around. But you know, globally, the UN has, has really made a commitment to um, adolescent girls and through all the agencies. And what the Secretary General has asked is that whether you're a World Health Organization or you're UNICEF or you're a UNDP, that you have a lens of understanding how all your programs affect girls. Um, I think this adolescent girls is unique to the fact that uh, whether you're talking about energy, um, health, housing, violence, um, opportunity education, all of that affects adolescent girls. So if you're a philanthropist, if you're a corporation, if you are an individual uh, or a big government agency, you can have a lens and put on the pink glasses and really think about how what you are doing is impacting the lives of girls. So for me, uh, one very positive movement is after you know, UNF and Nike and a lot of big groups put a lot of data out there about adolescent girls through their Girls Count report, all the different humanitarian and philanthropic industries are putting those pink glasses on and saying, I can look at what am I doing through a different lens. So that's been a very positive change. Um, the second thing is um, holistic approach to girls. Um, you know, a, a big thing we were seeing is you'd build a school, but then there was no health care or you'd give access to water, but there's no sanitary pads for girls, um, or freedom from violence in this area, but they're still not able to get an ID to go um, actually um, get their shots or whatever they needed. So a lot of organizations are starting to partner, which is important to make sure girls have everything they need. I, we can, I hopefully say that we as women and girls are very complicated. Um, my husband can, attest to that. Um, so it's not kind of that one-shot thing like in health for malaria or whatever. I mean, there's, we're complicated and we need all those things. So I think the holistic approach has been quite essential for all these humanitarian organizations. Um, for me, a favorite is Let Girls Lead in Agali. I think creating local advocates or what I call super girl lobbyists in their own communities to stand up for what they need. Because a girl in Guatemala needs something quite different than a girl in Jordan or, or in San Francisco. So really training them to become leaders in their own communities for their own issues, I think, is, is exceptional. Um, and then coming all the way local to here, I think you're right about um, fathers, husbands, um, brothers getting really involved in these issues is essential. Um, you know, your father is here. My husband is here. I mean, it's really important for the dialogue to cross um, all genders. So 
I think those for me are things that I've seen that have been really innovative and successful. Um, but the one plug I'll give is um, if you're making a donation or you're raising awareness, you know, take that next step to think about advocacy because the laws in this country or in your community really do impact folks and don't be afraid to be an advocate or a lobbyist in your own community and stand up for things that are important. You have a lot of power in your own district uh, to pass things for reproductive health, maternal health, um, education. So I would encourage everyone to do that. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. It's good to remember that. And uh, then Denise, again, getting into some of the specifics of uh, Let Girls Lead, what have been some of the key results of your work? Yeah, absolutely. So we work in a few countries in Africa and Latin America. And as Elizabeth mentioned, we're focused really both on girls' leadership and on advocacy. So creating systems change and ensuring that there are laws and policies and funding that protect and advance the rights of girls. And so basically our model is we, it's a tipping point model where we are working in specific countries, identify folks who are doing great work with girls and help them take that to scale. Uh, so for example, in Liberia, um, uh, there's, I believe the statistic is more than 75% of girls and women have been victims of violence. And one of the women that we work with there is Rosanna Shack, And she's just this incredibly you know, visionary and very um, spiritual person who has a deep commitment to girls. And so for years, she's had a safe home where she has had you know, basically a home for girls who've been victims of violence. She makes sure that they can go to school that they get the skills that they need so that when they finish school, they can actually get jobs and have a livelihood. And they're in a safe and protective environment. And you know, over time, she's probably been able to have, I would guess, about 200 girls in this program in her safe home. And she came into our program in 2010 and really started to think differently about how she can improve girls' lives. So, going beyond the girls in her home, in her community, and thinking about the fact that in Liberia there is no law, or there was no law, that protects girls comprehensively. <coughs> so what she did was work with another couple of folks who had participated in our program to launch an amazing advocacy campaign to get a national children's law passed that guarantees comprehensive protection in terms of girls' access to education, girls' access to health services, prevention and elimination of child marriage, prevention of harmful traditional practices like female genital cutting. Um, so really going from reaching a couple hundred girls in a very intimate way to also actually reaching 600,000 girls in Liberia and ensuring that they're protected and have rights and can enjoy and really live lives like, you know, Elizabeth's daughter hopefully will and that my two daughters hopefully will. So that's really the model of what we do and how we do it. And, you know, we're very focused on really working with folks in country who both know their own context, know their own reality, know the opportunities best. Um, so, you know, what we do is really support them to do the work that they really know needs to be done. So, for example, in Malawi, our partners have done a lot of work on child marriage. So, engaging girls in really advocacy with village chiefs, where they've been able to get village chiefs to pass community bylaws so that a man who marries a girl under the current, under the age of 21, so the legal age is 15, right? But in Malawi, actually, girls are often married as young as 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, and so what our partners have done is work with a group of girls, you know, similar in some ways to Rhea, who, you know, have talent, have vision, have potential, and are leaders, and help them advocate with village chiefs to pass these bylaws so that a man who marries a girl under the age of 21, his land is taken away, and he has to pay a fee of, I believe it's seven goats, um, which here in San Francisco may sound a little strange, but actually in Malawi is a huge, huge deal. And since they've started this work in 2011, they haven't had a single case of child marriage take place. So it's those kinds of initiatives and those kinds of people who, with just a little bit of extra resources and support and connections, can actually kind of take the good work that they're doing here and just you know, blow it open and really take it to the next level. 
That's great. Very, very encouraging to hear. And then, Claire, you know, I wanted to get back to what you were saying <clears throat> about the involvement of boys and men in terms of some of the issues that are facing girls globally. And, you know, if you could talk about maybe some of the specifics in terms of how they've been involved in improving girls' lives, in terms of preventing early marriage um, and early childbearing, some things you can um, talk about that. <clears throat> Clearly, the examples you've heard so far are very inspirational. And one way that, one strategy that we've used that's been really very successful is to engage young people in doing the research themselves. So we do participatory research where we bring both young men and young women in high schools, and we've been doing this model in the Bay Area, but I really think this is a model that could be used internationally. And what we do there is we work with the young people to figure out what is the question that they are really interested in? What is it that they like to learn more about? And we have trainings that we conduct. It's not just saying, oh, go and be a researcher. Uh, having been a researcher and having gone through a process of uh, a lot of learning and a lot of years of learning, we know that young people need the guidance and need the nurturing to be really good researchers. So we work with them on developing what the research question is, and we try to attract both the young men and the young women in this kind of work, and we try to attract not just the A student or the you know, B student, but perhaps the student who's not been as actively engaged. Once we work with them on figuring out what the research question is, we actually help them figure out what's the best way for collecting this information. Is it through a survey? Is it through collecting a, a focus group? And then once they start gathering the tools and gathering the information, we also help them with entering the data and analyzing the data and producing the data. We've had then the experience of teaching them how to present the data. So we've had young men and young women come together to present to school boards about why they want a policy to be changed at their school. In a number of schools, for example, these young people couldn't access condoms. And so they went to the school board. But here again, we prepared them by having them rehearse what they were going to wear, how they were going to speak. And they got the school board to pass a condom distribution program that clearly is going to protect young women against an unintended pregnancy and an STD but it is also directed to young men. So that's the kind of strategy that requires both an investment in young women, but also a young uh, men's investment. And a, a second element of that study was mental health. I think that one of the things we really need to face are the incredible pressures on young women in their societies and how oftentimes young women are feeling very discouraged, depressed, and how these kinds of programs that you've been hearing about tonight help them to give them some tools and support in ways that they have not had in their communities in the past. So as a result of the model that I'm just touching on is using community voices of the young people to shape policies and also engaging them in thinking about their futures and possibly for them to become the researchers so I have someone to replace me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. And I love that emphasis on getting them to uncover and discover together the data that supports uh, these issues. Thank you for that. And then, Ria, I wanted to ask you, um, why do you think it's important to let girls lead? Well, um, I did mention a lot about why I'm interested in this, but beyond that, I think that it's, it's just so important for especially American girls and boys, as Claire was saying, um, to recognize that they are, are relevant in all of these issues, and especially the issue of girls in leadership. Um, I think we all, especially young people like me, we all can make a difference at this age. We can make a difference at, at the age of nine. It doesn't matter how old you are. Um, it's important to recognize that the issues are out there. So I think, number one, making sure that you get educated on the issues um, because it's, it's important to understand what you want to be interested in. So if you, uh, I mean, letting girls lead is, is one issue, but there, there are so many issues out there, and I think it's very important for people like me and um, even people who wouldn't expect themselves to get involved in something like this. I know 
two years ago, I, I would have never expected to be sitting here talking about girls' rights. Um, I've always been interested in it, but after really delving deep and understanding that I can empower myself and that it's so important to let myself lead, let other girls lead, um, after that, I was, I was really able to understand what I'm really passionate about, and I think that's why it's, it's important to let, let us lead. That's yeah. great. Well said. Thank you. And uh, this next question, I want to get a response from everyone on our panel, and uh, it, it's how can people in the audience get involved? Would you like to start? I'll start, yeah. Um, so I, there are so many ways to get involved. Um, I, I don't know every single way, but personally, I've, I've been able to get involved with advocacy, which um, some of the panelists have mentioned. is It's such a powerful way to get involved with the government, and it's, it's so simple and, and easy. You just have to contact your representative, or you can go to Capitol Hill. There's so many different ways to get involved with advocacy. Um, but also awareness um, is also is one of, I think, the most simplest, the simplest thing to do. Um, as a high school student, I have 1,200 people who will hopefully listen to me if I put posters up, if I make announcements um, at my high school. And I think it's very simple if you're, if you're willing to recognize that the issue is present. I'll just say that um, I think the best way to get involved is whatever you're really good at. Mm -hmm. So if you um, have, a, have an interest in donating money and you're very focused on it, whether it's $10 or a million, um, it's great to become a philanthropist and one that is really focused on women and girls because it's such a small mm -hmm. piece of the pie, 2%, I'll say it again. <laughs> um, or if you are an advocate and you feel good about advocacy and you want to go talk to your district um, office, whether it's Congress or the Senate side, advocacy is powerful. If you're, if you're a talker, like I am, and you want to raise awareness and go talk about these issues in your, in your church, in your community, wherever that is. So I, for me, it is, um, well, let me just say, if you're an accountant, Go volunteer at a, at a women's organization. I'm sure they need your help. We're terrible in the nonprofit with numbers. Um, so whatever your skill set is, uh, you'd be surprised how incredibly helpful you can be in these issues. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where, what I would say. And, you know, girlup.org is a place to go to and learn about these issues. Um, and it will point to, to a lot of other great girl organizations. So I'll just I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you, Lisa. I think another way of getting involved is to really think about your own passion and to be really thinking about what are the areas that really, really concern you, whether it's happening here in your own backyard or if it's happening halfway around the world. Because of social media now, it's much, much easier to be connected to issues of political issues or economic issues or cultural issues. And to be thinking about what is the other group of individuals that you could align yourself? What are the networks that you can be part of? We all recognize how very, very busy everyone is. And sometimes it's discouraging to say, well, how am I going to change this law? Or how am I going to make my pitch? And to be thinking about what can I do in an hour? What can I do in two hours? What can I do in a week? And to be thinking in a piecemeal way, but strategically, with a group of other advocates working on this issue, whether it's against poverty, whether it's social justice, whether it's economic development. But I do encourage you to be thinking about how you can make a contribution, whether it's financial, or whether it's your time, or whether it's your skill, or whether it's your art and passion. Um, it's hard to top all of these great answers. I guess a couple of things, somewhat echoing and then adding a couple of things. So I think the first that Rhea mentioned is key is to learn more. So all of you are here. That means that you're interested. That means that you care. And that's the first step. And so finding places and resources to learn more about the realities of girls here in the US and around the world. So you know, one place is our website, letgirlslead.org. Um, and then there are tons of other great resources that are out there for how to support and invest in girls. Um, another one that we always say is to wear girl glasses. So kind of as you read in the newspaper or hear on the radio a story about a girl, you know, in a country in Syria or in Omaha, try to imagine what that girl's life is like. Try to imagine what she hopes for and what she dreams and what are her problems and what are her challenges. And think about, you know, whether that girl is in Malawi or if that girl lives down the street from you, what can you do? to help that girl realize her potential and her dreams. 
Um, and then the last is, um, you know, we are really trying to expand our own work, both around the world and here in the US. So, you know, if you're interested, we love folks' support. You can like us on Facebook, go to Twitter, Let Girls Lead, and donate on our website, which is letgirlslead.org, um, because there's a ton of amazing work that needs to be done, and we're really excited about finding ways to do it. Great, thank you. Um, now we've received quite a few um, questions from the audience. And uh, I want to start with this question. Um, the audience member said, it's clear that investing in girls is very cost effective in terms of development. But where would you target that intervention? Is it in education? Is it in reproductive rights? Is it legal rights? Who wants to take a swipe at that first question? I, mean, I can take a stab. I was talking to students earlier about um, there, there is a basic infrastructure of health that, that is needed before we can send girls to school, before they can get leadership training and so on. So um, while, as I said earlier, girls do need that holistic approach, health is all of us, if you get sick or if you're hungry or um, you know, something is off in your body, you're not going to be able to participate in whatever activities are in front of you. So for me, a base investment in health is essential. And uh, again, every country has its own needs or so on. But the, the thing that's exciting about health right now is there's a lot of solutions out there. I mean, innovation in health is just killer. And so it's just a matter of getting the resources and the political will out there for countries to provide that for their girls. So. Um, it's not just a personal opinion, it is the UN's opinion that that, that is um, the forefront of need is basic health care. Um, but I'm sure my panel panelists have different opinions. And thinking about a comprehensive approach, I really appreciate that you said that so many times our funding is very siloed. So we focus on health over here or education over here or <coughs> environmental issues or social justice issues or legal issues. And so to be thinking about a village model, that is, it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to bring together all of those different elements and to coordinate all those elements. So along with health, and I'm a very strong advocate for health, is to be thinking about education as part of health. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, education is over here, health is over here, but we often have to think about how do we bring those two together? So. Um, a concern I have is around immigrant health in our country. So how do we use English as a second language as a place where young moms of children can get health education as part of the English learning opportunities so that they, we can be starting to think about intergenerational kinds of strategies where we help both the mom and the young girl or the mom and her son to be thinking about health and well-being and health promotion as part of both an education message and a health message. Um, since we understand that investing in girls has a strong impact, and maybe Elizabeth, you can speak to this you know, from a historical perspective, what have been the barriers for foundations, for corporations, to make those investments? We know they work. Why are we only getting the, the two cents on the dollar? Um, I think early, earlier on in, in development, we made the mistake of thinking youth programs uh, was, was completely comprehensive for boys and girls. And I think the intention was that case, that uh, investing in youth um, was, was pulling everyone in, but culturally, um, that just was not the case. So we, we did a lot of studies about six years ago that showed 90% or excuse me, participation in youth programs was usually 90% boys in developing countries. So I think we, were, we made a misstep and an assumption that wasn't true that youth programs were including girls. Uh, so that was just a mistake. Um, I think now as we look across uh, all of these issues where we do have the right data, we understand what we need to do, we just got to get the right people in the conversation. Um, I was so floored uh, when the debate on Capitol Hill was happening last year around reproductive health, um, insurance, um, providing birth control pills, and the panel of witnesses were all men. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, have any of them squeezed a baby out? Because I, I have, <laughs> and that's just not the way I would go out of that, that opinion. So I think that we just have to have the right people at the table um, right now to debating these issues. Um, 
talking about what needs to happen and, and investment strategies will shift. Great, thank you. And then uh, I've had a couple questions that came in um, from the audience and they want specifics in terms of cultural barriers mm -hmm. um, that you face in working with girls and whether that resistance or those barriers are coming from their individual family members or from society writ large. So some examples of what those barriers are and you know some best practices on how you've dealt with them. Who would like to start, Denise? Yeah, I can start. Um, in every country, obviously, it's very different. And within any country, there are a lot of differences as well. Um, so I'll speak you know, to a couple that I know relatively well. Uh, for example, Elva, who's in the film Poder, her reality is that you know, she is the eldest of six children. Um, she, her family is extremely poor. In her family, you know, her mother was married very young. Her grandmother was married even younger. And there's a cycle, this intergenerational cycle that doesn't value girls doesn't see the point in educating girls because they're just going to get pregnant anyway. And so it's very difficult to change people's mindsets. And that's why what we've seen to be very effective is engaging girls in advocating for themselves. So, you know, part of what we've seen in the videos that have come in on the girl, Global Girls Conversation is, you know, everything from convincing the mayor to invest in girls to actually just, you know, talking to my dad and telling him that I really deserve the right to go to school. So that's, you know, one situation I think. Um, in some of the other countries that we work, for example, in Malawi, child marriage, which I mentioned, is just widespread and common. And, you know, people don't really bat an eye at a girl getting married at age 12. And, you know, a girl who gets married at age 12, that means that she's probably having her first baby when she's 13. It means that she's at incredibly high risk of maternal mortality because she's, her, she's just physically too young to actually carry a pregnancy and have a child. So the number one killer of adolescent girls is actually maternal mortality. So death because of either pregnancy or childbirth. Um, and then, you know, even if she does survive childbirth and has her child, she's not able to continue her education. She likely will go on to have several children so that, you know, by the time she's 24 and could be graduating from college, she instead has six children that she's trying to feed in a family that, you know, again, doesn't value ch girls. And so the cycle just repeats. So it varies, I think, quite a bit. But at the same time, I feel like there's a lot of commonality across the countries that we're working in. And like Claire mentioned, even here in the US, you know, I think the challenges certainly are somewhat different here in the US, but not as much as we would think in terms of girls being victims of violence and the challenges that girls face in terms of, especially in poor communities, being able to pursue their educations and fulfill their potential. And that's why we really focus on the importance of investing in those girls, in the most vulnerable girls, and helping them kind of break out of those cycles of poverty. I think it's also really important to begin to identify what I consider early adopters. That is, somebody who is willing to be an informal leader in his or her community. I don't think that we can give too much um, we can't overemphasize how difficult this battle really is. Mm -hmm. And so we have to find those initial um, cutting edge kinds of people mm -hmm. who might, for example, a man who has two daughters or several daughters who can begin to think about mm -hmm. their lives of their, uh, in their future and to be thinking about what would it be? What would be the next small step? Is it a baby step that we can take in a village or in a community? That's why I've been very impressed for example, with community land lending programs, mm -hmm. where small groups of women come together to develop a product or to develop a business. And in the US, there's been some teenage pregnancy prevention programs that have begun to incorporate mm -hmm. that concept of shared, lo of shared loan to develop a product that they can sell in their own, in their own small town. So I, I want to underline the points of the fact that this is a, a struggle. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. The wonderful new opportunities that we've been hearing about, this is really courage. And cutting edge people sometimes get bloodied. And we have to recognize that these informal leaders are going against perhaps thousands of years of history and tradition about the role of women. So I am a strong advocate for identifying those early adopters and then using them to help 
inform others in their community. And I'll give you a very brief example, just from Monterey County, where the uh, immigrant families, farmers, were, farm families, were very worried about being able to let their young daughters go on to college. It's a little different from an international model, I totally agree with that. But the point being that we found a couple of parents who were willing to let their daughters go to college two hours away. And then we used those parents to help inform the next generation, the next year of high school kids to say, you know, I too was afraid of letting my daughter go away two hours from our home. But in fact, I found that she came home frequently, she didn't get in trouble, all those fears. So I guess the last point I just want to make or underline is we need to use these informal leaders to be the formal leaders of other peers as a means of convincing villages and communities and cities and countries. Great. Uh, you're a mind reader. One of the <laughs> members in the audience asked a, a question, and I'd like to get some feedback from the rest of the panel that piggybacks on what you were saying, Claire. Uh, the question is, you know, is there a direct role for the diaspora communities in the Bay Area, for example, to sort of help uh, with these girls' empowerment in developing nation issues. For example, you know, uh, groups that are in the Bay Area, uh, Fermina, Guatemalan, Pakistani, mm -hmm. uh, Indian, what's those, your, those what's your thought? Those are incredibly powerful advocacy groups. So um, to, to walk into a district office um, here and say, I, I'm, I'm living here in the United States, I'm paying taxes, and I expect my, my U.S. government to be supporting girls in, in my home country is, is actually quite powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and diaspora groups are usually very organized, and so I think there is an opportunity, even greater opportunity for them to leverage um, that organizing power to influence a lot of policy making. Great, thank you. And then um, we had a question and you may want to give some of your experience with this, Rhea. Um, how does social media impact girls' empowerment? How so, are you guys using it? So as you all know, social media has become such a powerful tool that people can use all around the world for so many different things. Um, but specifically for letting girls lead and, and empowering girls everywhere, there are simple things that you can do with social media that can get the word out, first of all, awareness, spread awareness. So um, the first thing that you can do to uh, take advantage of social media is to like and uh, follow all of these amazing uh, girl groups. So um, some of the diasporas that they were talking about, those are some really powerful groups that need support. And that's a simple way that you can, I mean, many of us here have Facebooks and Twitters, and, and we go on it more than once a day, probably. Um, or so 4,000. 4,001, maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but adding those uh, amazing groups to your list of friends is um, a great way to stay involved and also to learn more, which is very important. And uh, keeping it local uh, here, uh, we had an audience member who wanted to know, how can we advocate in schools for health and education I issues affecting girls? Any strategies, tips for that? So um, one way that I know very, I know a lot about it um, is starting a Girl Up Club at your school. So if you go to girlup.org, you can find out um, a lot about that. So uh, I actually, st I'm in the process of starting a Bay Area coalition of Girl Up Clubs. So that's basically what high schools are going to be doing um, in the near future. So. The idea is that every high school starts a Girl Up Club, and um, it's, it's just like any other extracurricular club, but it focuses on the issues facing girls in developing countries. Um, and we would kind of collaborate um, once a month as uh, the entire Bay Area, and hopefully um, as a nation in the future. Another way could be also to be thinking about small fundraisers that young people in the high school areas of the Bay Area can be using to generate dollars to be able to send them to uh, their communities, if perhaps the communities of the countries that they came from, as a means of developing a school or a new program back home. Um, another strategy to me is to really think about 
what's the quality of your current school? Is the school providing high quality, comprehensive sex education? Is there water available that's very good to drink in the school? You know, what, I mean, what are the issues that are most compelling and have the greatest trajectory, uh, traction for the young person themselves. So asking young people, what are the issues that you're concerned about is a really important place to begin. And in many, many schools in the Bay Area and throughout our country and throughout the world, there are meaningful adults who really do connect with young people and who are the informal mentors. And it sometimes is not necessarily the, you know, the best and most popular teacher. Sometimes it's the janitor who says hello to you who you can begin to befriend and work with to do something different in your environment. So I, I want to give uh, value to the fact that partnerships between adults mm -hmm. who are meaningful to young people and the young people themselves working in alliance can be a very important tool to figure out what are the things that bother you. Is it the environment? We have in the Bay Area such disparities around asthma, for example, and air quality. And we've had young people develop campaigns around what should be the air quality, what's the level of traffic that's close to my school, how many buses are idling right outside my school, what's the quality of the filters in our school. So the, the point that I just want to share is we need to be thinking about small but very impactful kinds of ways, and then use social media to capture those stories, <coughs> to share them with others around the world. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, Claire. Um, one question that I have from the audience is a lot of investment in terms of girls' education, elementary, um, secondary, or primary and secondary uh, schooling. What about tertiary as they move up in higher education? What are we, what's happening in terms of a pipeline to keep those girls as they grow into young women um, educated and economically empowered. I'll, I'll share something that I think is very exciting at the University of California, San Francisco. And normally when I have my ID, you have, you'll see a pin that says FG2C, which means first to go to college. And I'm the first one to go to college in my family. And our campus has identified faculty members who are first to go to college. And then students who are in the School of Pharmacy, Dentistry, Nursing, or Medicine, we are brought together so that these students recognize that there is a pipeline that they themselves recognize, but there are mem mentors right available for them in their campus, and that we try to really begin to change the climate for young people who often feel very isolated and who feel that, what am I doing here? Will they find out that I'm really a fraud? So we try to help and work on that issue. And the second I think we need to understand is that graduating from college, given how expensive it is to go through college and the ability to stay in college, I'm very excited about some of the programs that have been developed, for example, at San Francisco State and some of our community colleges, really aimed at helping young people who do make it from high school and they transition onto community college or four-year universities and the skill sets that are needed to survive. And I want to point out to a particular population that is really at risk, and these are young people who are in the foster care system. Mm -hmm. So the fact that these programs, some programs are beginning, and the fact that under the Accountable Care Act, the Obamacare, these young people are not going to be kicked off health insurance when they turn 18. They stay until they're age 26. And that becomes a very important nucleus for them to be able to continue with their education. And do you have any information on uh, whether uh, foster children are disproportionately boys, girls, or is it pretty split? It, I would say that the data is, shows that they're pretty much across the board, but they are a very high risk population. I'm, I'm just sharing that there are many, many segments of the population that we have to be especially concerned about, but this is a population that often is sort of underground. Um, and they've many times, both young men and young women, have experienced sexual abuse mm -hmm. or other kinds of violence in their communities, and they have a lot of trauma that we have to work with in many of these solutions. Okay. Um, this next question, I want to get uh, some recognition of countries who are doing things particularly well um, in making investments in girls mm -hmm. and uh, 
do you want to acknowledge some of the folks who, in your work, that you've been really pleased yeah, I mean, with their uh, progress? I think a big success story, I mean, they have a long ways to go, but is Liberia. I mean, you talk about, even six years ago, a place where it was full of violence, no girls were getting mm -hmm. educated, um, the refugee situation was brutal. And uh, they really come a long way. And I think President Johnson Sirleaf, uh, first uh, de democratically elected woman president on the continent of Africa, um, is, has really made strides. And she, is, she has put a stake in the ground and said, I'm investing in adolescent girls. And it has shown tremendously. And so it's really allowed the, the agencies, the, the great nonprofits to come in and, and take girls a long way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's great. Um, you know, Mal Malawi and Ethiopia both had significant child marriage issues. Uh, Ethiopia was one of the highest in the world. And, and um, they have made, I think, significant strides. Policy, they have a long ways to go to. Uh, but um, policy strides on ending child marriage and doing cultural campaigns to change it. Um, so I, I would definitely lift up uh, those three countries. Um, I think in this country, I'd love to see um, us be a positive story as in 10 years for maternal health. I'm very worried about that. We have a very, very um, low maternal health rate for a strong economy, embarrassingly low. I think we're in the 30s. And so um, we have a lot of work to do. So maybe someone will say we're a success story in a few years on maternal health. but. And uh, now looking, well, actually, we will say that everyone on this panel, obviously, is doing really good work in terms of girls' education and investment. But are there other nonprofits or NGOs that you want to let the audience know about who are also our partners in girls' leadership and empowerment? Yeah, absolutely. So, like I mentioned at the beginning, Let Girls Lead is a program of the Public Health Institute, which is based here in the Bay Area in Oakland and actually does a lot of work here in California but also across the country in terms of improving girls, women's and community health and family health across the board. So, you know, we work in the areas of alcohol and education and research and all kinds of important and comprehensive different angles to improving girls and women's lives. So that's definitely one that I think is a great organization. Thank you. Oh, and I hope the audience member didn't leave, but this is a, a shout out to Rhea here. How can I implement what you are doing in your high school to my high school, you rock? Oh, <laughs> no, you rock. <laughs> um, so that, thank you for whoever that was. Oh, you, you rock. Um, so just really quick, once again, um, girlup.org. Go to girlup.org, you'll find so many resources to start a club at your school, and as Claire said, fundraising raising awareness and advocacy. You can get involved in that kinds of stuff. And it's actually a very simple process. And the people at Girl Up are the best. They're so awesome. They're great to work with. Um, and getting involved in these kinds of nonprofits is actually much easier than people our age think. Um, and what's really cool is um, Girl Up allows you to, as a girl, to empower yourself to empower girls in developing countries. So girlup.org. Yeah, and I'll actually just echo that. So we've been really lucky to partner with Girl Up for our work in Malawi, where a Girl Up club in Chicago decided they wanted to use their girls' basketball team to raise points. And for every point that they raised, they were going to raise a dollar for girls' education in Malawi. And this group of girls, and with the support of their moms, who, again, youth and adult allies are so important, has actually been able to raise over $45,000 to support girls' education in Malawi. So again, finding ways that are you know, creative, everything from you know, basketball games, which I never would have thought of, to fundraisers and car washes, and kind of thinking creatively about how to use the resources and assets that young people have in terms of their energy and their power and their voices. And one thing also that I'll just say is, you know, we've already collected more than 30 of these videos of girls telling their own compelling stories of change. And we're actually hoping to collect many, many, many more. So what we're trying to do is really create a platform where girls are telling their own stories and highlighting their own success, both like Rhea said, you know, so that other girls can see like, wow, I could do this too. And so the global leaders and government leaders can see, wow, I mean, these girls are doing incredible things and really, we all need to be investing in them. So we're actually still accepting these videos. Um, so if there's anyone in the audience who wants to submit one, that would be great. There's a $10,000 prize. So whichever the best video um, clip will actually get $10,000 in both cash and training and equipment to create their own full film. So it's 
spread the word about that if you know of other young people who have important stories to tell. That's great. Um, another audience question, and we would be absolutely remiss if we didn't talk about uh, Malala uh, during a panel on Let Girls Lead. Um, maybe for our audience, if someone just wants to talk about their involvement, experience, how she inspires. Uh, I think Elizabeth should do that. <laughs> You want to start? Why don't you introduce who okay. she is? Uh, so Malala Yousafzai is a 16-year-old girl from Pakistan. And uh, as important, her father, Zia, is an educator. Um, he created the first girls' school in Swat Valley, where it's the largest hub for the Taliban. And so the Taliban uh, shut his school down when Malala was 12. And uh, she told her dad that she wanted to do something very public to support her father and stand up for girls' education because the Taliban then banned any girl from being educated. And uh, the Taliban is a terrorist group that was led by Osama bin Laden and it continues to be strong in that area. So Malala did a video blog for the BBC and continued that blog for a couple of years promoting girls' education and she was, she's just incredible. Uh, but unfortunately the, the Taliban climbed onto her school bus and shot her in the face a year ago this week. And uh, she survived, which is amazing, and uh, continues to be just an unbelievable advocate for girls, as does her mom and dad and two brothers. And um, she's actually coming out um, with her story Friday night on ABC, which you can watch. And, and she's incredibly inspiring. And if anyone's having a bad day, I, I <laughs> encourage you to read uh, the speech, her first public speech that she gave uh, to the General Assembly on July 12th at the UN. You can Google it and find it. And she says her greatest uh, revenge to the Taliban and the Taliban who specifically shot her is to pick up a pen and paper and continue her education. So her and Zia continue to thrive and be uh, incredible advocates for all of us. Uh, but more importantly, you know, she encouraged uh, when, when she was shot hundreds of thousands of girls uh, to stand up and use their voice globally uh, for girls' education. And I think she has been a tipping point uh, I don't know if you want to share what Girls from Girl Up have done. And yeah, um, so ever since, uh, she, so she was actually, um, the, the incident with her um, and the Taliban was actually a few days before the International Day of the Girl. So um, I was given the opportunity to actually go to the UN on that day, and um, I got to see Desmond Tutu talk about her. Um, and that was actually the first time that I heard about that incident, and since then I've I've stayed really close to media articles and um, things like that about her, and she's just such an inspiring person. For those of you who, who haven't heard of her, definitely look her up, look up her videos. She's, what's very um, amazing is how, how great her English is. It's something that, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, <laughs> she, um, she's a great, she's very educated, and she's um, an activist just like me. She's a girl just like me, and she didn't deserve what happened, but she's, um, one thing that she said, Elizabeth mentioned this, she's using pens and um, books as her weapons, which is so powerful and uh, definitely what I'm going to try to advocate to other people and spread her message. Um, so Girl Up has been able to do a lot of um, work with that, with advocacy and um, awareness. And we, we said, um, we started the I, or so the Malala Fund, which is the fund that um, Malala uh, Yousafzai is a part of, um, and it's based on her work uh, towards education, universal education. Um, we worked with them on the um, I Am Malala campaign, so we spread awareness about that and told people everywhere that I am Malala and we don't deserve this uh, univer universal education for all. So that's necessary. And one quick thing, I'll um, just talk about the importance of men in this, this thing. I asked Zia the other day, Malala's father, you know, how did he create such an amazing daughter like Malala? You know, because I mean, it's, it's a lot about the parents. And he said, you shouldn't ask me what I did. It's what I, in my culture, it's what I didn't do. I didn't clip her wings. I allowed her to soar. And um, that was such a powerful moment for me on we're all talking about what do we do for these girls and how do we help them lead? But, you know, to, in his mind, his, girl, his daughter was very powerful, even though she was in a a marginalized environment and in a poor community and that he just let her do what she wanted to do. And I think for us, we're always in the Western world trying to figure out, you know, how do we get them to do this and how do we empower and donate and, but, but these girls are brilliant and they're amazing and if we just allow them to flourish, um, I think we'd be surprised. And I see that a lot in refugee camps 
uh, when, when you think that these girls just came out of, you know, the Congo, for example, with nothing and, you know, they might have been raped and, but they're still, like, smiles are happening. They want to go to school. They're super fired up. I mean, it's just, it's pretty cool. So I think Zia's quote is a great quote for International Girls' Day about just don't clip their wings and let them soar. It was pretty cool. And then, you know, Elizabeth, someone was asking, you know, how do you get men to change their attitudes? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Malala was fortunate to, enough to have Zia as a dad mm -hmm. who was willing to, you know, let her develop her full potential. Um, and we know that so many of the issues, uh, particularly the health issues that are impacting girls, you know, men's attitudes about HIV, you know, having such a disastrous effect on girls. What can be done? How are we moving these attitudes to to make girls safe? Well, I, I think you're much better as, a, as an expert in this than me to answer that question. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the challenges are enormous, like you're saying, absolutely. And I think we're doing it. I think slowly and surely, you know, exactly like Elizabeth said, you know, giving girls even just the space to be able to dream and have aspirations and work towards those aspirations, those girls are the most powerful speakers for their own needs and their own rights. And with the support from, you know, important communities, programs, adult allies, they can actually change their father's minds. And not to say that it's easy, because it's not. And often it doesn't happen that nicely. You know, often the stories are not that pretty. But at the same time, there are really important gains that are being made in terms of changing people's attitudes. I think one of the key things that I've seen is focusing how um, on the economic argument for both men and women, right? So for example, a couple of stats from earlier, but one that really always sticks with me is a girl who goes to school for seven years, so that's elementary school, will get married 4.4 years later and have two fewer children than a girl who lives next door who doesn't get to finish elementary school. So that argument of, you know, you invest in a girl and it's not just changing her life, it's changing her family, the income she can bring into her nuclear family, the income and resources and opportunities that she can provide to the children that she may go on to have, and her community and her country. I think it's, to me, you really get men engaged by having men see that they too are benefiting by investing and engaging girls. And I have to give a little shout out to my husband because you know he's an amazing father who invests in our two daughters and really helps them understand the potential that they have. I mean, they're little, but still, that they can do amazing things in their life. And so, you know, starting in small ways and building from there. I think another strategy <clears throat> is to really think about convincing young men and convincing their fathers about the resource that young women are. In a number of villages in Afghanistan, <clears throat> when the villagers, uh, the elder villagers, saw how many women were dying in childbirth, they began to recognize that even though their tradition was that men weren't supposed to touch women, they actually began to accept nurse midwives to come and do the birthing process because they recognized that raising these babies without their mothers was such a deficit to the community. And so bringing together the data that we know about infant mortality, maternal mortality, and thinking about what are culturally acceptable ways to begin to shift to begin a tipping point into a different direction. So Malala's dad, it wasn't that he was just teaching his daughter, he was also attracting other young women in the community. And that becomes the nucleus for making some other kinds of changes in the, in the community and creating a momentum to say, these young women who are able to continue their education aren't only just influencing their villages and their, themselves, but multiple generations. And I would say that one last point is, as a, as a very proud mother of two young men, I think it's really the responsibility of women to train their sons mm -hmm. to be culturally accepting and rewarding and promoting of women's health and women's well-being and women's success. So we need to also recognize women's roles as they raise their sons to be uh, the new uh, advocates for women in their lives. That's great. And you know, I want to touch back on this, this notion of uh, sort of underscoring the economic benefit of full participation 
of women and girls in a community. Um, are you finding, are you seeing um, with a lot of emerging markets in developing countries, particularly in the African continent, we've seen a lot of economic growth in several countries in Africa. Do you, do you see a lot of the success in terms of investing in girls and women tracking along with you know, sort of these emerging markets, um, corporations understanding that are making direct investments uh, into the economies of these countries, understanding that the return on their investment will grow faster and be greater um, the more they're investing in girls. Any experience with this? I'll start with one of the comments, and that is, you know, we're seeing now migration patterns all over the world with many, many people leaving their rural communities <coughs> and going to urban areas. And in urban areas, it's much more expensive to keep the, you know, to either buy the things you want to buy or because all of a sudden you see what your neighbor has and you too would want to have a cell phone or you might want to have something else. And so shifting away from larger families where traditionally in rural areas you would be rewarded economically, quote unquote, by having larger families because the tradition was that these children would help to sustain the farm. When you move into urban areas, the economic pressures are so, so strong on couples and on individual families that you begin to see a shift in terms of childbearing, smaller families, and the recognition that you need two incomes in order to be able to make it in this environment. We see that very dramatically happening with Latino immigrants from Mexico, for example, who might have had larger families in Mexico, but when they come to the US and when they recognize how expensive it is to even have a small family, that there is a reduction in family size, which then also enables women to go into the workforce and be able to be much more of a partner. In some of the research we've conducted, we've actually seen a decrease in the amount of domestic violence when men begin to recognize that they need their partners to be able to work. And sometimes because of the recession we've had in this country, women have been able to have jobs that men have not been able to have. And so their economic ability to bring money to the family becomes a very important element in changing, ironically changing, the roles of women in our society. Something, I think, um, oh, go ahead, please. I was just going to say, you know, um, with at Let Girls Lead, we did some research, and I have to give a shout out to my great team back there. Um, but we did some research looking at economic empowerment specifically for adolescent girls, and we're really disappointed to see how little there is in terms of investment in economic empowerment and financial literacy job skills training specifically focused on girls. So we looked at a couple of countries specifically trying to see how girls' needs were being met in terms of health, education, and livelihoods in that economic aspect. And the vast majority, I would say literally almost 100% of the programs that we found were actually focusing either on women, so adult women, um, which of course is also important, um, or they were just focusing sort of broadly on a certain community. And we know, just like Elizabeth said, that when programs are broadly focused and focused on youth, the vast majority of people who benefit are boys. So, you know, as much as there is a tremendous value of investing in economic empowerment for girls, we've actually seen that there are very few initiatives that are doing that in a way that is having the scale and potential impact that it could. Well, now that we have Elizabeth <laughs> as the resident entrepreneur at the UN, hopefully that will be changing <laughs> um, as we move forward. And then, you know, we had a question from the audience, and I, I was curious, too, from each of you. Um, if you could explain, I mean, you all are doing this extraordinary work in helping girls. What brought you to want to get involved in development issues, girls empowerment issues. What was that thing that made you say, yes, this is the work that I want to do? And I'll start with you, Denise, and we'll work down the panel. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And I've thought about it actually recently quite a bit. Uh, so growing up, my mom is Argentine, and I grew up spending a lot of time in Argentina. Um, and I remember one particular moment, because someone asked me this recently, and I was trying to think, like, what was the moment? Um, and I remember being 12 years old on a train in Buenos Aires 
with my parents. And uh, this girl got on a train, got on the train, the doors opened, and she wasn't much older than I was. She was maybe 15. Um, and she was carrying a baby and dragging a toddler. And they were, you know, dirty and ragged clothes and um, clearly very, very poor. And I just remember, I still remember her coming down the aisle of the train, down the middle of the aisle, and asking people for money or food. And as she was coming, I couldn't hear exactly what she was saying, but clearly asking for help. And I just remember every single person just looking away. And I remember at that time feeling so angry and so upset that there was really nothing that I could do for her. And I remember at that moment deciding that I wanted to be someone who didn't look away and who did you know, engage in this kind of work. And I think that you know, and many other things that came thereafter is what started my passion for this kind of work. So this is another Argentinian on this panel. Um, <laughs> I'm originally from Argentina as well. And, um, and uh, that is a wonderful, moving uh, episode that you shared with us. I, I think I remember being a little girl and being very idealistic and wanting to save the world. Um, and I was very struck by Clara Barton. I remember reading books about you know leaders and um, heroes and heroines. And um, what really made a difference for me was the whole movement of women's health and reproductive health. And I was struck when I was in college about the fact that I could not think of anything more powerful than helping women and men decide how many children and when in their lives they would have them. And to me, that is one of the most freeing, uh, liberating, empowering um, elements in women's lives. And we have to recognize that the ability to give women contraceptive choice as well as their partners, as well as access to abortion care is extremely important. We lose so many women around the world due to an illegal um, abortion. And even in our country, we have to recognize that over half of the pregnancies are unintended. So we have a commonality in terms of perhaps having more access to reproductive health services, but that it is something that we share with our sisters internationally. So I'm not from Argentina. I'm from a little. <laughs> I'm from a little country called Texas. Uh, if you, I don't know if you've heard of it, um, but uh, I was an animal, I grew up on a cattle ranch. Animal science student uh, was not on this path at all. And uh, a friend of mine had dropped out of school because she was pregnant. And she didn't have uh, women's health services on our campus. So I got super involved in that, and it it just totally shifted my entire trajectory towards. Uh, the nonprofit space and community building, and I just fell in love with it and really saw it as a career. Um, but I'll tell you a more recent shift for me. Um, so, you know, I moved uh, up the ladder and, and through different humanitarian and nonprofit organizations. And for me, I had such a practical application of supporting women and children, and particularly in health. And I would visit refugee camps that. Um, have stories that just really would keep you up at night. Uh, but for me, I could handle it. And um, I really believed in the power of the United Nations and these big organizations and big programs. Uh, but after I had a daughter, I have a two-year-old, um, I went back to my first overseas visit was to South Sudan uh, last year. And I got to tell you, my lens had totally changed. And um, I do absolutely believe in the power of one intervention. Um, that if one child is saved, that is critically important. So the $5 donation for a, a book for a girl to go to school, a $10 bed net, because if you lose your child, the impact that has on yourself, your community, um, is unimaginable. So for me, I went from being a development professional to someone who deeply care about women and girls and the power of saving one baby. Um, because that could be my baby. And it, it was very, very, very difficult for me to handle. I actually haven't been back, haven't been back since. I've definitely shifted to a more uh, management uh, role, but uh, it, it reiterated why I'm doing this in a very different way. And to, instead of career and practical application and importance, it made it very personal. So. Uh, and so when she becomes yeah. Secretary General of the United Nations, <laughs> it's... <laughs> Done it. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> um, so I, I mentioned the story that kind of 
really got me interested in girls' rights, but I'd have to say that the way that my parents raised me as immigrants, um, I was the first one in my family to be bo born here. Um, they always emphasize the importance of girls being empowered. I have two sisters, so we have a house full of girls and my dad. Um, so as I grew up, I never really, I was never, um, I never had to deal with the issue of um, not receiving the same opportunities as boys because my parents, they had three girls, so they didn't have that situation where they had to choose between the boy and the girl. Um, so throughout my life, I, I had that question in my mind. When I, when I did experience things in school, um, boys playing football and saying no to me when I wanted to go play football with them, um, those questions kind of stayed in my mind. And um, even in middle school when I, in band, um, they, I wanted to play the saxophone. So they, they had two boys and me playing the saxophone. They said, we need someone to play the baritone saxophone. That's the biggest saxophone there is. Um, so we know that you're a girl, but we'll let you try. So they let me try, and I actually had the loudest sound. And to this day, I'm playing the baritone saxophone and the tuba, uh, which are traditionally, yes, the tuba, um, which are traditionally uh, male instruments. Guys play it because they have a greater lung capacity, but I kind of took it upon myself to realize that since I'm a girl, I can, I mean, despite the fact that I'm a girl, I should be able to do these things that boys can do. Um, and that kind of led me down that path. And how about you? How did you become yeah. interested? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always uh, wanted to see things be fair. Mm. Um, it, it was not an abstract notion uh, to see discrimination in play, um, to see lack of opportunity in play. Um, to see women who were earning less than men. Um, you know, I was raised for a good part of my life by a single mom. So, you know, these were very personal. You know, I lived it, I saw it, and um, as my life through education um, became better and better and more empowered, um, I wanted opportunities for girls coming up behind me to be available. I simply wanted to give back because so many people had helped me, made sacrifices for me, that it was just imperative that I, um, I do the same. So that was, that's what spurred me on in terms of doing my work with role models and helping girls. And um, one last sort of parting thing, if you would have the audience walk away with one important thought, the best takeaway from our panel tonight, what would that be? Um, I'll start. Um, make sure that you recognize that you are relevant and everyone is important and can make a difference in a spectrum of, of ways. And that educating yourself is definitely the first thing um, and making sure that you can make a difference. Um, because we're all important. I would say um, be an advocate. I, I just can't stress enough the importance of policy around these issues. So um, it's very easy to write a letter to your member of Congress um, on, on the range of these issues. The US does set the standard for the rest of the world on both appropriations and policy for girls. So um, all you have to do is go to .gov and put in your zip code, and it will point you right to your congressman. And you can write them a letter that easily, and it does get counted. And if you're, if you're really ballsy, go into the district office and sit down and have a meeting. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll make a huge impact. I would want to say think globally and act locally. Um, I would really encourage you to think about every young girl in your circle of friends. And maybe it could be a daughter, maybe it's a niece, maybe it's your next door neighbor. But to be that askable parent, meaning that askable mm -hmm. adult, even if that's not your child, is very important. Um, I've had experience of working with a, a physician who shared with me a story. She was raising a foster care child, and on the day that that child graduated from high school, she asked her to make a list of all the people in her life that had made a difference in her being able to graduate. So she expected that you know maybe there'd be two or three people that they, she might mention, a teacher or even herself. The list had 
48 adults, 48 adults, meaning that it was the person who crossed the street who said hello to the young woman. It was the person at this grocery store who treated her nicely. It was many individuals who you'd never think was shaping the life of this young woman. And yet those people working in concert together really had an impact on her life. So think about yourself as being one of those individuals and don't be silent. Yeah, I would build on Claire's and say, um, you know, act locally and act globally. So, you know, here what we're doing is building a global movement to invest in girls. And all of you just being here tonight is a part of that. And the more that you can share that and encourage your friends and your networks to support and invest in organizations and programs that benefit girls, the more that we can create concrete changes both in the lives of you know, that one girl in the refugee camp and in the lives of the 600 million girls around the world who really have the potential to transform our global reality if we can give them the support that they need. Well, thank you. That concludes our program this evening. And on behalf of the World Affairs Council, I ask you to uh, continue the applause for Dr. Claire Brindis, Dr. Denise Dunning, Miss Elizabeth Gore, and Miss Rhea Singh uh, for this excellent discussion. And many thanks as well to you in the audience for the terrific questions that we got. And uh, come back again. <laughs>